think different. Romans chapter 12 is where we're picking up our study this morning as we've been making our way through the letter of Romans. And Romans 12 begins a new major section in the letter of Romans. After spending the first 11 chapters explaining the theology of the Christian faith, Paul is now going to talk about living out the Christian life and the Christian faith. Uh, So we want to begin in verse 1 of chapter 12, and he writes, excuse me, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Therefore, he begins, and this therefore, it doesn't refer back just to the last a couple of paragraphs of chapter 11, but to all that Paul has talked about in the letter of Romans up to this point. This, therefore, is like the hinge or the pivot point for the whole letter. It, It marks the transition from the theology of God providing salvation for us through Jesus Christ to how our salvation is to now impact the way that we live our life. Paul has spent the first 11 chapters of the letter laying the theological foundation for the motivation for why a Christian should live a certain way, why a Christian should obey God's Word. People are motivated by many things. Fear, money, recognition, comfort, pain, admiration, The motivation for us as Christians, as people who have received salvation from God through Jesus Christ, is love and gratitude. We don't follow the moral teachings of Christianity because we are trying to earn God's acceptance. We've been accepted through Jesus Christ. We don't do it because we are afraid of God's judgment. His judgment has already fallen on Jesus Christ for our sake. We don't do it to accumulate spiritual brownie points so the scales will be tipped in our favor on the final day of reckoning before God. There is no scale for the one who is trusting in Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. We obey God out of gratitude for the unbelievable grace and mercy that He's given us. We obey out of love for our Heavenly Father. We obey as an act of worship. There are many good-intentioned believers, though, who continue to live under the heavy burden of trying to earn God's acceptance and approval. Paul has spent the first 11 chapters of the letter of Romans trying to get it through our thick skulls that we are accepted and approved. We are justified through faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us, not what we do. As we move into these final chapters of Romans, please do not lose sight of that. Do not now begin to move into a mindset of works after we have spent so much time talking about what God has done for us. And so he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, and this phrase captures the main idea of the first 11 chapters of the letter. God's mercy has been extended to us. Our salvation is an act of God's mercy. The gospel is God's mercy shown to undeserving people, giving His Son to die for us, justifying us freely by faith, giving us His Spirit to be with us and in us, and making us His very children. In view of God's mercy, considering God's mercy, because of God's mercy, this is how we should respond. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Under the old covenant system of the Jewish religion, an animal's life was given in an act of sacrifice. Under the new covenant relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ, 
We're being asked to give our life to God as a living sacrifice. The sacrifice we offer is not to make atonement for our sins. Jesus Christ has done that for us through his sacrifice on the cross. Instead, we are offering ourselves as a sacrifice in response to the atonement that has been given to us. We are asked to give ourselves to the Lord, not to die for him, but to live for him. We are a living sacrifice. We are to live our life as an act of worship to the Lord. This kind of living sacrifice that we are called to offer as a response to God's unbelievable mercy is holy and pleasing to God, it tells us here. Seeing his child say thank you through their life choices of obedience pleases our Heavenly Father. Seeing his child say, I love you, by seeking to imitate Jesus pleases our Heavenly Father. These are holy sacrifices in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. It says, this is your true and proper worship. Offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice is the sensible, reasonable, appropriate response to the grace and the mercy that has been given to us. It's the right thing to do. To do otherwise would be disgraceful and grossly inappropriate. We're taught as little kids to say thank you in response to a kindness that has been extended to us. God has extended the ultimate kindness to us, forgiving our sins, justifying us, declaring us righteous when we are not, giving us salvation, promising us resurrection and eternal life, adopting us as his children. Does all of that warrant a thank you? Of course it does. And we say thank you to him by offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The, the Greek word translated into English as conform means to be molded into the shape of, to take on the pattern or the image of something. The Greek word translated into English as transformed, it means to change the essential nature of something. J.B. Phillips translates the Greek into English this way, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your mind from within. The New Living Translation translates the Greek into English this way, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. The society and the culture around us is not to set the standard for how we live, for what we understand to be right and wrong, for how we understand reality. Instead, we want to be transformed in our thinking, in our understanding, taking on the mind of Jesus Christ, being like him in thinking and behaving. It can be difficult when the prevailing and popular way of thinking and behaving says one thing in the Bible gives us a very different standard to live by. Believer, I want you to know, though, that this has always been the tension that real Christians have lived under. What you and I are facing in our life at this moment in history is not uniquely different or difficult. The Christians in the first century found themselves in severe tension with the society and the culture surrounding them. Saying things like, you know, th things are different now. The, the teachings of the Bible are out of date with what is commonly accepted behavior now. We are not expected to adhere to those old, antiquated moral ideas in our more sophisticated, enlightened, modern age. That's an attempt to rationalize our behavior. Rather than trying to rationalize our behavior, we need to be transformed in our mind to see and understand things the way that the Lord does. We don't want to take on the image of the world around us, but made into the image of Jesus Christ. How are we transformed? Having our mind renewed. How do we think differently and become this different person? 
It's an internal work done by the Holy Spirit. The Lord changes us inside. As, as this new spiritual life that He gives us grows and becomes stronger and fills us more and more, and we cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit that He's doing in us through the intake of God's Word and putting it into practice and engaging in things that nourish and encourage spiritual growth. Prayer, worship, fellowship, Bible learning, repenting from sin. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. A Holy Spirit renewed mind is able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we think like Jesus Christ, we're able to understand and know God's will, what God understands as good, what pleases God, what leads to His purpose being done in this world. When we think different, we live different. Verse 3 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So continuing with the idea of having a renewed mind, of thinking differently, Paul addresses how we are to think about ourselves in relationship with others. In particular, others in the church. It says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. We're told up in verse 2, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Having an inflated opinion of ourself, bragging, being egotistical, being arrogant, being full of ourself, putting ourselves first, looking out for our own personal interests first over all, those are all patterns of this world. But we're to think differently. We're to live differently. Having an inflated opinion of ourself and our importance is something we are to avoid as followers of Jesus. In the kingdom of God, humility is highly valued and something to be pursued and practiced. Philippians 2, 3, Paul writes, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We're not to be motivated by selfish ambition. We're not to be conceited and full of ourself. We're to value others above ourselves. We're to look out for the needs of others, putting them first. We're to have the attitude of a servant toward one another. The next verses in this same Philippians passage point us to Jesus as our example to follow. In Philippians 2.5, he says, In your relationships with one another, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It says, but rather... Think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Thinking of, our, of ourself with sober judgment means to think clearly and honestly about who we are in relationship to Jesus and each other. We've been rescued and given a new life by the Lord. He loves us and values us beyond words. This puts us on equal footing with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all loved and valued beyond words. We're not valued more than others. We're not valued less than others. And when we're able to remove personal egos from our relationships with each other and put Jesus Christ at the center, it's a joy, isn't it, to serve each other and with each other? I mean, no one is trying to show off 
No one is trying to promote their self. No one is looking to advance their self at the expense of another. People are not getting their feelings hurt because of perceived slights and criticisms. There's no drama. Everyone is working for the same big goal and the same big boss. And that's fun to do, isn't it? It's a misery when it's all about self and everybody's ego. We want to think differently. We want to live differently. Verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Paul uses the human body to illustrate how all of us in the church are to interrelate with one another. Just like our body has many different members, and those members don't all have the same function and purpose and responsibility, so we are all part of one body in the church, believers, with different functions and purposes and responsibilities. And Paul is going to elaborate on this idea in the next verses, but before we get there, I want us to take special note of the last phrase in verse 5. It says, each member belongs to all the others. This is a very important idea for us to get hold of as followers of Jesus and members of his church. In the culture we live in, individualism is prized above all. Looking out for ourselves and being accountable to ourselves first is the ideal that is embraced. But in the kingdom of God, in the culture of Jesus, in the community of the believers, we are interconnected with one another. We are interdependent on one another. We are responsible to one another and for one another. We are not our own. We belong to each other. This is thinking differently. This is living differently. And it's a tragedy that many people's feelings of responsibility to the church, they, they don't go any further than an hour on Sunday morning. That's all their commitment goes for the other folk that are part of the body of Christ. Church is little more than an activity to them. Social club, meeting that they attend when their schedule allows for it. Church is not a spectator sport. Every one of us are supposed to be on the field, in the game, making a contribution. Every single one of us. No Christians, real Christians, are to be sitting up in the stands. That's where all the critics sit. The participants are on the field. They're in the game. Verse 6, he says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We each have a place in the body of Christ, and we each need to be filling that place in the body of Christ that we're supposed to. Paul lists a number of different gifts in these verses and <clears throat> ways of serving one another, and people can get all hung up on trying to figure out what their spiritual gifts are. I don't think that's what we should be focusing on here. That was not Paul's point here. I am sure that they didn't have a spiritual gift inventory test that they were giving the people in the city of Rome in the first century. I, I can guarantee you that they were not doing that. The message that comes through and which we should be focusing on is this. We should all be using what, he, what we have been given to serve the body of Christ, the church. What God has given us, each individually, is supposed to be shared with the rest of the body. And the second thing is, when we share what we have, we should do it with the best 
effort that we can. Just phoning it in is not okay. We should be giving our very best effort when we are serving the church. I mean, he lists these gifts. He says, if you're this, then do that thing. And do it with all of your might. Do the very best job you can at that thing that you're doing. Coming late and poorly prepared to help, for example, is insulting to the Lord and his people. If we did that in a job, we would get fired, and rightly so. We should be giving our very best in every way. That's clearly the message that Paul is giving us here. Flip over to 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 4, he, he teaches the same thing in the letter to 1 Corinthians, but he elaborates on it quite a bit more here. So in verse 4 of chapter 12, for example, he says, there are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Did you catch all that? The spiritual gifts, the talents, the abilities, the interests, the opportunities, the perspectives, the backgrounds, the money, the other distinctives that we each have are given to us by God for the common good. Not for our own selfish pleasure and gain, but for the common good of the body of Christ, the church. That's thinking differently. That's living differently, isn't it? Because in this world, it's all about looking out for myself. And Paul says, that's not the culture of Jesus. If we skip down to verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 12, it says, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it should not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Some of the big ideas that come from this passage and the others that we have been reading here is that we are all members of the one body, the church, and we each have a part to play in it. Christian, our primary call in the church is to contribute, not to consume. It's to contribute, not to consume. Are you a consumer or a contributor? Do you take and take, but rarely if ever pitch in and contribute? Is the church here mainly to serve you, or are you here to serve? Are you looking to see what you can get out of the church, or are you looking to see how you can add value to the church? We need each other. When any one of us is not showing up, 
doing our part, the body, the church, is incomplete, and we all suffer. Our participation in the body, the church, isn't optional, it's essential. We're not all the same, nor should we try to all be the same. The Lord has given each of us a unique expression of Christ that is to be offered in service to the body of the church. We're connected to each other. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. When, when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. There must not be division between the parts of the body, the church. We need to be united. This life that we have been called to live as followers of Jesus is intended to be lived with each other. Now, I know it can be inconvenient and frustrating to do it with others sometimes, but we need each other. And even if you don't think you need us, we need you. In closing, considering the mercy that God has given us in Jesus Christ, let us give ourselves to him as living sacrifices. And now as his children and citizens of his kingdom, let's think differently and live differently. I close with Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the challenge that you have given us today through it. To think differently, to live differently, Lord. That we are part of a whole new kind of family and society. That we don't take our cue from the world around us. We take all of our directions from you, our Father. Lord, it's so good to be your child. We ask that you would fill us with your peace, with your joy this week, Lord. You would remind us how precious we are to you. And Lord, that we would indeed live our life as a living sacrifice and we would give ourselves not only to you, but to each other as part of the one body of Christ. Make these things so in us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.